Greetings and salutations, friends. My name is, of course, Charles Q. Banks, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Caesar, Charles' anime episode summaries and reviews. So today I'm continuing my One Punch Man Season 2 series with Episode 4. If you haven't seen the previous episodes, you can look at the playlist, and I'll have the link of that in the description below. So let's get stuck in with Episode 4, shall we? Uh... The intro to episode 4 is, of course, a flashback. Now, flashbacks can be done well, and they can be done poorly. They are usually done poorly. Um, a good example is the Hellboy 2019 uh, movie that a lot of people didn't like, and one of the reasons was because it had tons of flashbacks. I liked that movie, and I didn't mind the flashbacks very much because they were very fast-paced. Kept the tension of the show kept the plot moving, even though they were giving a lots of exposition as well. But there were so many of them, I could totally understand anyone being kind of bored with yet another flashback. So, you know, you want to go with something that has a reason for flashing back, it's like the Bourne series of movies. The flashbacks are written into the fabric of the show and the plot itself. I say show, but films. Um, there are so many of them, it might as well have been a series, but they really used flashbacks to their advantage. And even in those, some people complain about too many flashbacks. In One Punch Man, there are three flashbacks in four episodes. Okay, there were two, count them two, in episode two. And in now episode four, it starts with a flashback, just like episode two started with a flashback. And it's very confusing to start an episode with a flashback. And uh, the last couple times, it was, um, I can't remember his name, Chuchun Ch Maru? <laughs> I know that wasn't it, that's Kano Suba, but um, I'm going to call him that from now on. From now on. Silver Fang student, Chuchun Maru. Uh, he had a flashback, then Saitama had a flashback. I think there was a flashback in the first episode, but that is okay, considering it's the first episode of a second season. Um, but... Now we get a flashback from Garo, and it flashback flashes back to himself as a child. And it's one of those types of villain flashbacks, you know, the kind. The kind in which you are given a piddling amount of information that is expected to explain the entire motivation of the villain and his character. And it's really shallow, really simplistic, hyper-simplified, uh, and it really reminds me of the type of flashback, the same type of flashback, in the show Boku Dakinga Inaimachi, which translates roughly to the city where only I am missing. Um, and uh, it's very, very infamous for having a villain with a really bad and poorly explained motivation, and one of the ending... I think the last episode begins with a kind of dream sequence in which the villain is talking to himself, talking to the audience, about why he kills children. And he just likes to see the red string of fate snap whenever he kills someone. And it's like, okay, I could have I could have thought of that myself. Like, it's very easy to infer, um, you know, and, and I think they thought it was artistic. But it was so... It, it wasn't anything more than that. It was that simple. Um, it, it, not use, not a good use of time or effort. And uh, I, I'm not sure why they did this as well. They could have done a little bit more. Maybe you like it. I don't know. It's kind of a, a nitpick of mine. But this flashback, I don't think, really has a place here. Um, although, it does give us something of, a flat, of more backstory to Garo, um, almost to the extent where I'm noticing that Garo is kind of like the, he, while he's the antagonist, he's almost treated as a secondary protagonist. We get lots of time with Garo, and lots of time in which we are seeing through the eyes of Garo from his perspective and his position, even while he is hunting heroes. Um, which is interesting, I like that, uh, if they would go into his backstory further, and not just with hyper-simplified flashbacks. But uh, let me know what you think about that. I, it, not a huge thing, but um, he wakes up in an alley after this, so apparently that was like a dream in his mind, 
and in a trash pile in an alley. Okay, so this indicates that um, what I was asking before was correct. That um, in the last episode, I was wondering like what happened after One Punch Man did the one chop and defeated him right off the bat, and Garo fainted. Did he leave him there? Like, he thought he was a thief, so obviously he didn't know he was Garo, which is kind of hilarious. He was going out to look for Garo, and he's going to a whole tournament in order to fight Garo, but he meets him and immediately defeats him and doesn't even know it. He thought he was some kind of street thief. And so Garo wakes up the next day and he's not taken into a hospital he's not taken to a homeless shelter he's not taken to the police or the authorities or anything he's just put in an alley someone carried him and stuck him in a trash pile which is very strange considering that the world that one punch man is set in is kind of like a pseudo futuristic uh hyper heroic first world place you know it's not like there are tons of people fainting in the streets and you just throw them in the side of the road or in, into an alleyway. Um, although I'm sure that that all, always happens in big cities anyway. But it, it's a little weird. People are definitely looking for Garo, who know what he looks like. And somehow they didn't pick him up all night when he was lying half dead on the road. Um, it was a very strange turn of events that he would just wake up randomly. It's very convenient for the story because he gets to go his own little way and continue his goal of killing more uh, S-rank heroes and meeting with his little child friend who can give him the information on the heroes. Another little nitpick is he's talking to this little boy on this bench, for this park bench, and reading from this boy's hero guide, which is a lot like the journal uh, that Deku reads in uh, My Hero Academia, and, um, you know, the similarities are endless, but he makes friends with this little boy, he doesn't kill him or anything, which shows he has some kind of compassion, and of course we saw that he was a kid too, right? So that means that he is okay with not killing kids, um, even though he's okay with killing anyone else. Um, I guess it's strange to expect someone to want to kill a kid immediately, but I don't know. I, he might. Why not? Um, so he kind of befriends this kid and is finding out the weaknesses of the heroes and their strengths from this kid and his blasted hero guide. Like, why doesn't he already know this? Why doesn't Garo... Why hasn't he gone somewhere else to find this information? If the child was able to get this book, surely it was available somewhere else where an adult could go and find it. Garo probably could have just gone and stolen it from a library and no one would be the wiser. And if they did try to find him, he'd kill them. Like, he should already know these things. Um, anyway, another nitpick that may not mean anything, but, um, yeah, so... The story continues on, and this is where the characters kind of, their paths diverge, okay? And there are multiple different paths, uh, forking paths that, that take place here. And Saitama continues on his own little way, um, and I love the fact that he is going on a, on a hero tournament, a uh, fighting tournament, uh, using an and someone else's ticket and impersonating them, Chuchun Maru, in order to get in. Uh, it's hilarious because he's doing it the exact same way that Spider-Man did um, and is trying to test out his skills in the ring for the sake of money, you know. <laughs> it's hilarious because One Punch Man is shown, once again, to be very monetarily motivated and monetarily minded. Uh, he does not care about the fact that it's probably illegal to impersonate someone in order to get into a tournament. Um, and he has to deceive people in order to, to continue being there. When he's there, he puts this ridiculous wig on <laughs> to look like Chuchun Maru. And, um, and it's, it's great, but it's like, okay, he's, he's off on his own little adventure, I guess. He's not even a part of the plot anymore. How is this going to come back full circle. How are How is Garo going to get into conflict with him? Because that's really all we want to see as the audience. Maybe they come together and they part ways again and get interrupted in a fight, 
with other characters and then someone else gets kidnapped or something and then they have to fight again but we that's what we want to see we want to see development with those two main characters but instead instead because of the threat of garo the hero association sends out s rank uh heroes to protect and be bodyguards for the hero association officials because garo already offed one of the officials of the hero association and so now they're all scared so an s-ranking hero named metal bat is introduced and he's immediately introduced as like a protagonist or at least a really strong um side character and he is set to protect these very western uh officials a very large fat western official and his son who are very entitled and really taking advantage of japanese culture and uh not minding their manners at all in this sushi place and he has to try and intervene uh to not to make sure that they don't do that very much which is kind of a jab an uncomfortable uh social commentary there but uh all in good fun and then giant centipede monsters show up and attack the officials on purpose so there's something going on behind the scenes these monsters know who to attack and metal bat of course has to fight them and this is where the animation comes into perspective because there is some very good traditional drawing here some very good traditional animation um and it's kind of, it's the same quality as uh episode three keeping it pretty high there is actual movement there is actual speed and high frame rate uh traditional drawing but then i kept looking at certain ones of the monsters and i love the naming sense here because it's the same as in one punch man season one um for example cent uh, centipede uh there's there are centipede monsters right and so one is called Sentikohai, and then once he gets killed senti senpai comes in and he's a huge one right <laughs> so that's pretty hilarious i love that and metal bat has to deal with him too but Sentikohai gets defeated and then sentichoro comes in and he's like a dragon level monster and he is like hundreds of feet long uh massive thing with a human head on the front that looks like it's being eaten by another human head that is also being eaten by a giant centipede dragon chomper face with six eyes so it's really good to see some crazy awesome weird comedic looking um bad guys in one punch man again it's been a while honestly um but something interesting about the animation those monsters most of them looked really good like the line art was great for them but i noticed that they were being very they were very fluid and i was like wow the animation suddenly just jumped up in quality or something but then i kept watching and i realized those are probably digital effects aren't they those are digitally created models of giant centipede monsters and lo and behold you know when choro shows up it's you can't even not think that they're 3d models because metal bat has to fight them and you know he's an awesome character uh too he's basically the typical chad gangster boy with the red tank top and black leather jacket and the hakama and the metal bat and slick back pompadour um and just you know he can take some hits and he can dish it out you know he doesn't take any crap from anyone except for the officials that he's working for um and he fights them and he's traditionally drawn like the entire time but these creatures are like super high frame rate but metal bat stays at the normal frame rate and then there are these other two heroes that are like even less high quality drawn and they're like super side characters like you don't even care about them uh, it's like a pineapple man and an ant man or something <laughs> saving people and the monsters are chasing them and in the for the these two heroes are in the foreground and they are like barely detailed really low frame rate and the monster is just like you know in the background <laughs> so it's like you can really tell the difference and it's really distracting um it looks great i think the effect is awesome but it would have 
found its place in an entirely 3 3D CGI modeled world where all of the characters are CG modeled and with that kind of um, cell shading look to the 3D models that you find in, in games like Ultimate Muscle and Zelda Wind Waker. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of off, but there were some really cool fight fighting going on. I have some good fight scenes. Um, and of course, Garo hears the, the, the demon or the dragon uh, level threat warning and goes to fight Metal Bat. And that's basically where the where the episode ends. The ending credits roll and then the after credits is some martial artist uh, who the girls love, apparently. We might have seen him before. I don't know. He comes onto the scene and... Uh, He's like, take me to the tournament, girls. And and that's the true end of the episode. So it's like, there are two big um, plot lines going on here simultaneously that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And it really takes down the tension and the, the, the speed, the pacing, and my interest in the show, honestly. Because while they've kept the quality of the animation pretty high... Not as high as season one, of course, unfortunately. But they haven't kept up the tension in this episode. The tension, even though it's just one episode, the tension seems to have plateaued because the focus has gone off of our main characters and onto Metal Bat and how Garo <clears throat> in the next episode is probably going to fight Metal Bat and probably going to win. And, you know, Saitama can't show up because he's embroiled in this tournament adventure. And is probably going to fight that martial artist. So, you know, it, it's not a disappointing episode, but it's one that really doesn't get me excited for the next one. Um, maybe you had a different experience with it? Uh, let me know in the comments below. Um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the subject. So, thanks for watching. I am wondering about giving a review score to these things, to, to each episode. <laughs> that seems a little banal, but um, it might work if I continually rate every single episode. Maybe I can give an aggregate score at the end, but um, let me know what you think about that as well. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching and farewell.